Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome all of you for this session today uh, on a journey through images for a quick revision in embryology on systematic embryology. This is the third part of the entire series which we have run across the period of last one week. This is the third part of it. Uh, we again welcome you all. I will hand over the talk to Priyanka to introduce the author and then we will begin with the session here. Thank you, Kritika. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone, all the participants here in this third masterclass of our series, uh, where we are here to revise embryology quickly with Dr. Rose Xavier. Let me first start by giving a brief introduction of our speaker, Dr. Rose. Uh, she is an assistant professor in the Department of Anatomy at Government Medical College, Trichur, Kerala. She completed her graduation and post-graduation also from the same institute. Uh, she has published more than 10 national and international scientific articles in various journals, and she is an assistant editor of the National Journal of Clinical Anatomy. Recently, Dr. Rose has been selected by NPTEL, Swam Prabha Academic Channel, under Ministry of, uh, Ministry of Human Resource Development, Government of India, to deliver video lectures on embryology. Welcome, Dr. Rose. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rose, uh, as already discussed, uh, Dr. Rose has already discussed general embryology and uh, systemic embryology in the previous two masterclass sessions. So today she will be covering the topic of uh, central nervous system and eye. But as promised, Dr. Rose, we will begin by answering some of the questions asked by the participants in the last session. So yep. uh, we have identified four questions, Dr. Rose, which uh, were asked by multiple participants. So uh, should I read them to you now? Okay. Uh, so the first question, Dr. Rose, uh, is can primary oocytes arrested in diplotene stage of prophase 1 can be a reason for the increase in birth defects among older mothers? Actually, the thing is, uh, when a female uh, baby is born, the baby is having the oocytes meant for its reproductive period. So whenever a cell is actually remaining for a longer period, there will be DNA damage and uh, uh, that, that is the proteins which bind the chromosomes will be damaged over years. And in this particular question, I think the, uh, the person has asked about the uh, trisomy, the anomaly called trisomy. So what happens is, uh, again, during cell division, uh, the chromosomes won't be actually getting separated. So they will remain as a pair in case of oocyte and it will actually where during fertilization what happens is one single chromosome will come according to the, uh, the set of chromosomes if it is for the 21st we have down syndrome like that. So ultimately what happens is instead of a single pair we have three chromosomes in one set of number. So that is the reason why uh, you call it as non disjunction of chromosome. So uh, that is the reason why uh, we get more number, uh, more cases of Down syndrome in uh, ladies who get pregnant uh, towards older age, say roughly after 35 years of age. Pranga, one more thing. Uh, there is, I think the slide is not moving. Uh, okay, Dr. Rose, can you just try again or I will upload the presentation at my end then. Okay, I'm trying. Yes, it's okay. Any more questions? Hello, Priyanka, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Dr. Rose. So I will read the next question to you. The next question is, what is the fate of primitive streak? Actually, the primitive streak, uh, when it's formed in the epiblast, it gives rise to all the three germ layers, like the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm proper. So it's usually formed during the 15th day. And uh, later what happens is uh, toward, uh, after fourth week, it usually start regressing or it will uh, start diminishing in size and finally it just disappears. Sometimes the primitive streak will uh, stay there at the caudal region. And you know the primitive streak is made up of primordial germ cells, isn't it? And they are, uh, sorry, it's made up of pluripotent cells so that, so that they can give rise to any type of cell. So what happens is if this primitive streak is seen as a remnant in the caudal region, this will give rise to uh, a tumor which will contain derivatives of all the three germ layers. 
okay and since it is seen in the caudal region uh, or in the sacral region you call this tumor by the name sacrococcygeal teratoma the word meaning of teratoma is it will be made up of uh, uh, derivatives of all the three germ layers so that is the fate of primitive streak usually um, when the baby is born there won't be any remnant of primitive streak if at all present since it is made up of pluripotent cells it will give rise to derivatives of all the three germ layers and you call it as teratoma Yes. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rose. So the next question I have is, uh, during IVF, is the nucleus of the sperm injected or the whole sperm is placed over ovum? That's a very interesting question. Actually, during in vitro fertilization, what happens is we are getting the sperm and ova from the donors and uh, we are creating an artificial environment just like the natural one so that uh, the sperm and ova will get fertilized as they do in vivo. Uh, for this, uh, we actually require properly functioning sperm number, isn't it? Uh, to complete the sequence of events leading to fertilization. But in uh, severe cases of male factor infertility due to lack of sperms in ejaculation, uh, like in cases of severely impaired spermatogenesis, or in some cases where uh, there is non-reconstructable reproductive tract uh, obstruction, in those cases, what we have, the condition is we have only a limited number of sperm. So we can't take the risk of just leaving the sperm with the ova. So what we have to do is we have to do some manipulations. You call it as micro manipulation. And uh, the, some of the steps we use are, uh, in some cases, we have to keep the sperm just under the zona pellucida. You call it as subzonal uh, sperm insemination. Sometimes you have to make a nick over the zona pellucida. Uh, you call it as partial uh, zona dissection. And sometimes we even have to keep the sperm inside the cytoplasm of the oocyte. You call it as intracytoplasmic sperm injection, otherwise known as ICSI. So that's it. So it's not always leaving the sperm with the ova. Sometimes we have to go for some micro manipulations as well. Um, thank you, Dr. Rose. So just one more question before we start today's session. Yes. Uh, and this question is, what is meant by Meckel's diverticulum? So uh, uh, when we uh, mentioned about the folding of the embryo, the cephalic folding, the caudal folding, the lateral folding and all, uh, the formation of primitive gut, we mentioned about a duct known as vitello intestinal duct, which connects the midgut with the yolk sac. Sometimes this duct will persist and this persisting duct is known as Meckel's diverticulum and there is a very interesting rule of two followed by Meckel's diverticulum that is it is seen in two percentage of population it is it presents before two years of age uh, it is two inches long it is two feet away from the ileocecal valve and it contains two types of heterotopic mucosa like it contains the pancreatic and gastric mucosa so this is an interesting rule of two followed by Meckel's diverticulum. Okay, so uh, Dr. Rose, now before uh, we start the session, just two, two or three points I need to tell to the audience. Uh, mm -hmm. Number one, uh, audience, uh, we are recording this session and a recorded version will be shared with you after the session. So all the participants will be able to get a copy on email after the, afterwards. Uh, secondly, uh, I want to uh, say that there is a QA and a tab in your, uh, in your screen. So whatever queries you have, you can post your queries in the Q&A tab and Dr. Rose will answer to them after the session today. And uh, one more thing I need to tell everyone is that uh, uh, there will be some polling questions in between the sessions. So uh, the answers are anonymous. So please feel free to answer them and keep this uh, session going live. Thank you. So Dr. S uh, Rose, you can continue with the session now. Thank you, Thank you so much. So we are moving on to today's session. It is systemic embryology and we'll try to cover the most important topics which are, which are always asked, that is development of central nervous system and something about the development of eye. So under the development of central nervous system, you have to be familiar with these terminologies, like what do you mean by neurulation, what do you mean by the neuropost, the, their, closure, their closure, then fate of neural crest cells, fate of neural tube, development of brain in the form of rhombencephalon, mesencephalon, prosencephalon, and something about the development of suprarenal gland and pituitary gland. So let's have the first polling session. Primary inducer of neurulation, which among the options you you feel correct? Yeah. 
five more seconds left. Okay. Here are the results. Okay, so I think uh, we'll come to, we'll come to it. So thank you. You can close the poll. So uh, during uh, embryonic development, what happens is whenever one structure is formed, it will induce the formation of the other. So uh, that is what is meant by inducer. And uh, I think some of you got confused with primitive streak. Primitive streak is considered as primary organizer. So neuralition is the process by which neural tube is formed and uh, neural tube is formed from the neurectodermal layer. That is what is meant by neuralation. So uh, when you look at this diagram, you can see a dot like thing, the black dot. That is the notochord. And by the formation of notochord, we have the surface ectoderm. The entire thing was ectoderm. By the formation of notochord, uh, the region of the ectoderm lying over it will get differentiated to form new ectoderm. Okay. So in this condition, the question was, which is the inducer for new relation? So in this condition, the notochord is acting as the inducer for the formation of neural tube. So uh, we know that the ectoderm is actually getting differentiated into new ectoderm, which is lying over the notochord, and the remaining part will be known as surface ectoderm. So this new ectoderm will first form a plate known as neural plate. Then what happens is, you know, on either side of the notochord, we have the mesoderm, the intraembryonic mesoderm. As the cells are actually uh, getting replenished here, there will be a projection on either side of the notochord upwards. So what happens is there will be a depression in the neural plate and this depression is known as neural groove. And the junction of the neural plate with the ectoderm, with the surface ectoderm, this junction, you call it as neural fold. So at this point of time, we have a neural groove formed from the neural plate and you have two neural folds on either side. That just means the junction of the ectoderm, the surface ectoderm and neurectoderm. Now what happens is uh, when you consider the entire embryonic disc from the cervical region, these folds will start approxim getting approximated in the midline. So it will start in the cervical region and it will go cranially as well as caudally. Okay, so uh, for the time being, uh, we know that there are two openings at either ends of the neural tube. So you know uh, what is the meaning of uh, keeping these two openings patent? Because during the development or neuralation, uh, we don't have a very established circulatory system to provide nutrition for the developing neural tube. So what happens is, we have the amniotic cavity above. Isn't it? This is the ectoderm and we have the amniotic cavity above. So if this uh, tube is kept open at both ends, what happens is that the amniotic cavity can run through the tube and it can uh, nourish the developing neural tube. So that is the reason why the tube is actually kept open at both ends. So uh, it uh, starts at the cervical region and the anterior opening, you call it as anterior neuropore or cranial neuropore and the posterior end you call it as caudal neuropore or posterior neuropore. And finally what happens is this will get approximated in both directions and it will close. The, both the anterior neuropore as well as posterior neuropore will, will be completely closed so that the tube will be uh, a single closed tube. So the anterior neuropore usually closes by around 20 somite period and the posterior neuropore closes by around 25 somite period. So when they close together, you can see that the neural fold cells, the neural fold cells are not actually getting incorporated into the neural tube. They are actually lying as a separate mass just above the neural tube in the midline. And these uh, cells are actually known as neural crest cells. So in the beginning, the neural crest cells will be a single mass which is lying on the uh, dorsal aspect of the neural tube. Later what happens is it will just split into two and it will just lie on either side of the neural tube and further what happens is this neural crest on either side will again divide into a dorsal mass and a ventral mass and they will just migrate dorsally and ventrally. So the neural fold cells uh, soon after closure they are not getting incorporated into the neural tube 
they are actually forming a separate mass known as neural crest cells they will be first seen as a midline mass later they split into two so that they lie on either side of the neural tube and further again they split into dorsal and ventral mass and they will migrate dorsally and ventrally so let's uh, so this is actually a fetus which got aborted say roughly around 28 weeks of gestation and uh, let's have a polling question now which is true about the given clinical condition is it failure of closure of anterior neuropore or the brain fails to develop or uh, it is diagnosed prenatally and terminated if 400 micrograms of folic acid daily 3 months before conception and throughout pregnancy given for prevention uh, can prevent this condition or are you saying all the statements are true please give your answers 5 more seconds to go very good response i think all of you knew this so this is a condition known as anencephaly anencephaly means the failure of closure of the anterior neuropore so can you please close the poll uh, so that is a condition known as anencephaly we'll come to it later so for the time being again you need to know about the derivatives of the neural crest cells this is a favorite question for almost all the exams and mcqs as well so we have mentioned that the neural crest cells are actually dividing into two groups and they are migrating dorsally as well as ventrally roughly speaking the dorsally they will form uh, the melanocytes in skin and hair follicles and ventrally they give rise to the sensory ganglia sympathetic and enteric neurons the schwann cells and cells of the adrenal medulla and uh, if you just have a look at uh, this diagram it will actually give the entire picture of the neural crest cells so uh, in this region you can see the cranial neural crest cells the neural crest cells seen in the cranial region are giving rise to all these derivatives you can see that it is giving rise to the connective tissue component of the cranial muscles the thymus the adenohypophysis the parathyroids and the thyroids then some yeah, somewhere here you have you can see the pupillary and ciliary muscle then type of cells of the carotid body then we have already mentioned about the dermis of the face and skin then the bronchial uh, arch cartilages and some contribution to the membrane bones of the skull when you talk about uh, the neural crest cells seen in the spinal region this is the limit okay so in the spinal region you can see that it is giving rise to the sympathetic ganglia parasympathetic ganglia of neck then you have the pre aortic ganglia adrenal medulla very important then also you have the dorsal root ganglia and the sympathetic chain now uh, the neural crest cells seen in both regions uh, cranial as well as the spinal region will give rise to the trunchocorneal septum we have seen the septum which divides the trunchus arteriosus into uh, the pulmonary artery uh, pulmonary artery and the aorta then you have the glial cells the schwann cells the melanocytes all these enteric ganglia all these are formed from uh, the neural crest cells seen in the cranial and spinal region so that's about the derivatives of the neural crest cells so let's see uh, one more polling question uh the polling is in front of your uh, screen right now okay so the question is all are derivatives of neural crest cells except we have seen many derivatives of neural crest cells right now out of the four options i have in mention one one option as the derivative of neural crest cells So, five more seconds. Very good. So, all of you are happy to know that all of you are attending the session very properly. So, adrenal cortex. Adrenal cortex is actually mesodermal in origin, whereas the adrenal medulla is actually derived from the neural crest cells. So uh, let's move on. Please go ahead, Dr. Rose. Yeah, I think I'm 
2027 ואת הסקלינג. Are you facing any challenge? No, it's, uh, I think it, the screen is actually stuck. Yeah, so just try to close the screen and upload it again. Okay, fine. So, uh, sorry for the interruption. Now uh, we are moving on with the development of the central nervous system. So we are in a stage where we have a neural tube formed with both the anterior neuropore as well as the uh, posterior neuropore closed. Now we have a single neural tube and it is actually giving rise to the central nervous system. So uh, at the cranial end, the neural tube is actually forming three important brain vesicles from which we have a further development of the central nervous system within the cranial cavity. And the caudal end is actually giving rise to the spinal cord. So the cranial end, we have the three brain vesicles, namely the prosencephalon, which is known as fourth brain, mesencephalon, which is known as midbrain, and rhopencephalon, which is known as hindbrain. So we have seen the neural tube form. This is the anterior neuropore. This is the posterior neuropore. Once these neuropores are closed, we have a single neural tube formed. At the cranial end, this neural tube will be ha having three brain vesicles. They are known as prosencephalon, mesencephalon, and rhopencephalon. Prosencephalon is otherwise known as fourth brain. Uh, these subdivisions you should be uh, very thorough with because all these things are favorite question for the examiners. So prosencephalon is actually giving rise to telencephalon and diencephalon. The two subdivisions of prosencephalon, you call it as telencephalon and diencephalon. And they will be giving rise to the cerebral hemispheres as well as the thalami and the associated structures. Mesencephalon, it is not having any subdivision. It is just giving rise to midbrain. And rhombencephalon, it is actually further divided into mechencephalon and myelencephalon. Once again, rhombencephalon is getting divided into mechencephalon and myelencephalon. And mechencephalon will be forming the pons and cerebellum and the myelencephalon will be giving rise to medulla. So why you call this as brain vesicle? We know that there is neural tube and at the cranial end, they are getting dilated and it is filled with fluid. So as these uh, forebrain, midbrain and hindbrain are getting differentiated, we know that there are some cavities enclosed within these. So let's see what are the cavities enclosed within each part of the brain. So in the cerebral hemispheres, we know that it is the lateral ventricle. Between the thalami, between the diencephalon, we have the third ventricle. Within the midbrain, the cavity is known as aqueduct. Uh, within the pons uh, and cerebellum, you have the upper part of the fourth ventricle. And again, uh, with the medulla and uh, cerebellum, we have the lower part of the fourth ventricle. So again, this thing you have to keep in mind, the cavities enclosed within different parts of the brain. So prosencephalon, it is have, uh, divided into telencephalon and diencephalon. Mesencephalon, there is no subdivision. And rhombencephalon divides into metencephalon and myelencephalon. So let's have a polling question now. Aqueduct of Sylvius is the cavity enclosed in. We just mentioned about the cavities in each part of the brain, right? So aqueduct of Sylvius is seen uh, in which part of the brain or it is enclosed in which region? That is the question. Very good. So the answer is mesencephalon because we know that in telencephalon, uh, we have the lateral ventricle, diencephalon, we have the third ventricle and the third ventricle is connected to the fourth ventricle within the rhombencephalon through a duct which is seen in the midbrain and the midbrain another term uh, or the midbrain is derived from mesencephalon. So the cavity of mesencephalon, you call it as aqueduct of Sylvius. Okay. Now, um, 
when the uh, when the neural tube is actually developing within the cranial cavity we know that the cranial cavity is a fixed space uh, just like when we mentioned about the development of heart tube we know that within the pericardium uh, if it just gets elongated it, it won't uh, be accommodated within the pericardium so it is just folding on itself to form the bulboventricular loop likewise the neural tube again if it enlarges it's uh, it has to get accommodated within the cranial cavity so it is actually undergoing so many uh, flexions so you call it as flexure so let's see the important flexure seen here so first one is teal and kephalic flexure so teal and kephalic flexure is a flexure seen between the teal and kephalon and dying kephalon of the fourth ring between the teal and kephalon and dying kephalon we have the teal and kephalic flexure then the next one is mesenchephalic flexure so can you see a flexure here this is known as mesenchephalic flexure and that is a flexure seen within the mesenchephalon the mesenchephalon is folding on itself and that is known as mesenchephalic flexure then the next one is pontine flexure so this region is actually the rhombencephalon which is further divided into mesenchephalon and mesenchephalon right so between the mesenchephalon and mesenchephalon there is a flexure and this flexure is known as pontine flexure at this point i i would like to mention one more thing here you can see that the pontine flexure is getting deepened so that there is a lip formed in the upper part and this you call it as rhombic lip so when you are asked to mention about the developmental source of cerebellum so it is from the rhombic lip we don't have time to finish all the minor details so that's the reason why i'm adding this point here uh, with the formation of pontine flexure from the mesenchephalon you have a lip form that is known as the rhombic lip and it is the rhombic lip which is giving rise to the formation of cerebellum and uh, the last flexure which uh, the important flexure which we have to mention here is known as the cervical flexure and cervical flexure is actually seen between the spinal uh, spinal cord and the rhombencephalon that is the cervical flexure so these are the most important flexures you need to know uh, in the development of central nervous system because all these again can be asked in various mcqs now uh, we'll move on to the next slide uh, first we will see the internal architecture of the spinal cord how the development of spinal cord is happening within within the neural tube so we know that uh, the neural tube after its formation it will be lined by a group of cells known as neuroepithelial cells okay so the neuroepithelial cells will then just get converted into a group of cells known as neuroblast and the neuroblast will be actually forming the mantle layer can you see the mantle layer here the big, uh, blue colored region that is the mantle layer and the fibers arising from this neuroblast will be terminating at the periphery and they will be forming the marginal layer so once again the neural tube uh will be having a lining epithelium that is known as neuroepithelial cells they will be actually getting transformed to form neuroblast cells the neuroblast cells will be arranged towards the cavity and uh, they are known as uh, that, that they form a layer that is known as the mantle layer and the nerve fibers arising from the mantle layer will form the outer marginal layer so we know that the mantle layer is actually giving rise to the gray matter because in the spinal cord we know that the gray matter is inner and the white matter is outside so uh, the mantle layer will be giving rise to the gray matter and the marginal layer will be giving rise to white matter now we need to know how are the cells within the mantle layer further arranged there is a sulcus you can see a an oblique sul uh, horizontal sulcus separating the two parts of the mantle layer dorsally you call it as so after the formation of the sulcus limitans you call the mantle layer dorsally as the alar plate and ventrally you call it as basal plate so alar is actually the sensory part and basal is actually giving rise to the motor neurons so you have the mantle layer further subdivided into alar plate dorsally and basal plate ventrally and the basal is motor whereas the alar plate is sensory and we have the sulcus limitans separating these two plates and uh, so this is the spinal cord and as we move up towards the brain stem what happens is after soon soon after the spinal cord we have the medulla right 
So uh, till now, the spinal cord was just in the form of a tube. And when it reaches the medulla, what happens is it will be opened up just like uh, you open a book, isn't it? So what happens is the dorsal ala plate will be now lying laterally. You can see the dorsal ala plate lying laterally. And of course, the basal plate is almost towards the midline. And the sulcus limitans, the position of sulcus limitans also shifted towards the lateral aspect. So it is not just lying dorsally and ventrally. When it reaches the medulla, it is lying medially and laterally. And you know, uh, the basal plate is actually further getting subdivided into uh, the efferent neurons. We know that uh, uh, the functional columns of the cranial nerve are arranged in this manner. So we know uh, the efferent set of neurons are actually derived from the basal plate and the efferent set are derived from the ala plate. From, so from the basal plate, we have uh, the somatic efferent, which is lying more towards the midline. Then we have the special visceral efferent and followed by the general visceral efferent. If you have a clear cut knowledge of this formation, it will be easy for you to know the functional uh, column formation of the different cranial nerves. So uh, somatic efferent, what do you mean by somatic efferent? So they are the neurons concerned with the skeletal muscle. Then special visceral efferent means they are going to supply the branchial muscles. With special visceral means always related with branchial arch derivatives. So since it is efferent, it is motor and it will be supplying the branchial arch muscles. General visceral efferent means it will be uh, supplying the smooth muscles and glands. Now talking about the sensory component, uh, we have first the general visceral efferent, which carries general sensations from the viscera. Then the next group is special visceral efferent, especially the taste sensations. Uh, then we have the somatic efferent. Somatic efferent, it can be touch, pain, temperature from different parts. So this is how uh, the dorsal uh, ala plate and ventral basal plate gets shifted when it ascends up in the brainstem. So in the brainstem, the arrangement, the pattern of arrangement is a bit different from that of the spinal cord. So likewise, uh, the regions will differ in pawns in midbrain also. I'm not going to the detail right now. So uh, this is actually uh, a newborn. And if, sorry, can you please clo close the pole? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, this is actually a newborn. Uh, you can see uh, on the dorsal aspect towards the sacral region, there is a defect. You can see something fleshy, right? It's not covered by skin. So what is this condition? What is the baby suffering from? So let's have the poll. Identify the neural tube defect. So in which clinical condition we will get uh, this picture or in which defect you will get this clinical condition. Identify the neural tube defect. Anyway, it is a neural tube defect. So what it is? Very good. So that is spina bifida. This condition is known as spina bifida. We have already mentioned that. Uh, if the anterior neuropore is not closed, you, you get anencephaly. And uh, depending upon the severity, we have uh, many different types of uh, anterior neuropore closure defects. Similarly, if the caudal neuropore is not closed, we get spina bifida. And again, you, get, you have different grades of spina bifida. So, um, Let's have a look at the fear, what all defects you get if the neural tube is not formed properly. So this concept, you have to make it clear because I have seen students finding it a bit confused. That is the reason why I included this slide. So uh, this figure, this figure, we can see that from cranial end to caudal end, the entire neural tube is just exposed to surface. So this condition is known as crani craniorachiasis, and this is actually said to be a very severe or serious anomaly. Now, uh, this, these three figures, these three figures are uh, actually anomalies related to failure of closure of neuropore, the anterior neuropore, the cranial neuropore. If the cranial neuropore is not closing properly, you will get all these three 
conditions. The first one is anencephaly where the brain is not at all formed. In the second one, you get meningoencephalocele. Encephalon means brain. So meningoencephalocele means you have the meninges along with the brain protruding through a defect. And this condition is known, known as meningocele, the third condition. Meningocele means just the meninges with the fluid is herniating. The brain, the encephalon is not herniating. So these are the three defects which you get when there is a defective formation or defective closure of the anterior neuropod. Now coming to the neural tube defect at the caudal end, we have these three defects. The first one is myelocele. So what do you mean by myelocele? So myelocele means the spinal cord is exposed to outside. Okay, myelo means something related with the spinal cord. So spinal cord is actually exposed to the surface. The next condition is meningomyelocele. Meningomyelo means the meninges as well as the spinal cord is exposed. So here the difference between the myelocele and meningomyelocele is in meningomyelocele, we have the meninges covering the spinal cord. And the third one is meningocele. Meningocele means only the meninges is actually protruding, whereas the spinal cord is not protruding. So if you understand these terminologies, it will be very easy for you to understand many clinical conditions. So these are the main uh, set of neural tube defects which you will come across. Uh, now uh, we will move on to the development of suprarenal gland. When you talk about suprarenal gland or adrenal gland, you know that uh, there is a cortex which is covering and uh, there is an inner medulla, adrenal cortex as well as adrenal medulla. So adrenal medulla, this blue colored region, it is actually derived from the neural crest cells. We have already seen it. Now, what about the adrenal cortex, the outer part of the uh, adrenal gland? The adrenal cortex is actually developed from the mesoderm uh, just lying around the adrenal medulla. So the first formed mesoderm of the uh, adrenal gland, you call it as uh, fetal cortex. So the first formed mesoderm which is covering the medulla, you call it as fetal cortex. And the, as the medulla is actually getting incorporated into the fetal cortex, there is another layer of mesoderm formed around the fetal cortex. And that is actually the definitive cortex or the permanent cortex. Now, in course of time, what happens is you, you can see that the fetal cortex is actually diminishing in size and soon after birth, uh, you are not getting any remnant of the fetal cortex. So, uh, where are the other layers coming from? So, at birth, you know, so there are mainly three layers for the adrenal cortex from outer to inner aspect. You have zona glomerulosa. Then you have zona fasciculata and the third layer is known as zona reticularis. These are the three layers of adrenal cortex. So soon after birth, you will be having zona glomerulosa and zona fasciculata derived from the definitive cortex. And later on, the zona reticularis will be formed to the inner aspect of the cortex and it will be lying closer to the adrenal medulla. So for the time being, you have to remember two things. Adrenal gland has got cortex, outer cortex and inner medulla. Medulla is uh, from neural crest cells and the cortex is mesodermal in origin. And the cortex, uh, the mesoderm first forms the fetal cortex and outer to it, you have the definitive cortex. And soon after birth, the fetal cortex will just diminish in size and will just disappear. And the outer cortex, the definitive cortex will give rise to all the three layers, the sauna, glomerulosa, fasciculata and reticularis. If you want to have a, say, a detailed uh, session on this, you can just um, search in my YouTube channel. I would like also like to add the development of pituitary gland. Again, pituitary gland is derived from two different sources. The first one is the ectodermal pouch. Here you have the oral cavity or the pharynx and from the pharynx you have a diverticulum forming and that is known as the Rathke's pouch or this uh, oral ectoderm is actually giving rise to Rathke's pouch once it gets uh, pinched off from the uh, oral cavity. Likewise, you have the diencephalon, the neural epithelium, which is giving rise to a diverticulum uh, or you call it as in infundibulum. So now you have to know what are the derivatives of each. Rathke's pouch, which is derived from the oral ectoderm, and the, the infundibulum, which is derived from the diencephalon. What are the derivatives? So Rathke's pouch, if you have a closer look, you can see that there is an anterior wall, a posterior wall, and there is a cleft in between. So the anterior wall is actually giving rise to pass anterior. The posterior wall is actually giving rise to 
pass intermedia it's not pass posterior we usually tend to say pass posterior no it is pass intermedia and some of these cells will actually encroach onto the infundibular region to form pass tuberalis now coming to the infundibulum uh, the derivatives of the, uh, uh, the infundibulum are it will first form the stalk and the remaining portion will be forming the pass ner nervosa so these are the different parts of the pituitary formed from two different sources. The suprarenal gland and pituitary gland, since they are having two different sources, again, uh, these will be uh, We know that uh, in the forebrain, on either side of the forebrain, in course of development, a dipping will be formed. This is known as optic sulcus. Okay. Then what happens is this sulcus will get deepened. And it will finally form two important structures. This is known as the optic stalk and the distal dilated portion is known as optic vesicle. So the optic stalk and optic vesicle are actually prolongation of the forebrain. Now what happens is this will reach the ectoderm because uh, the brain vesicle will be lying just uh, below the ectoderm, right? So the point where this optic vesicle reaches the ectoderm, at that region, the ectoderm will be actually modified to form a placard known as optic placard. So that will be forming the optic placard, otherwise known as lens placard. Now, this optic placard or lens placard will start invaginating. You can see that it was a flattened structure here. Now what happens is this is, will start invaginating. So when it starts invaginating, the optic uh, vesicle cannot uh, st uh, stay like that, isn't it? So it also invaginates so that it will accommodate this developing lens vesicle. So the lens placard which is formed here will invaginate and it will ultimately get separated from the ectoderm to form a vesicle that is known as lens vesicle. So you have two vesicles here. Optic vesicle formed from the brain and the lens vesicle formed from the ectoderm. So in order to accommodate this lens vesicle, what happens to the optic cup? It will also invaginate. And now you can see that the optic cup is having two layers, the outer layer as well as the inner layer. And the space between these two layers, you call it as intraretinal space. Now, uh, as the optic cup invaginates, this will actually give rise to a fissure. Can you see a fissure? This is actually getting invaginated, but they are not actually meeting. So there is a fissure formed within the optic cup and along the optic stalk. So this is known as choroid fissure. And the purpose of the choroid fissure is uh, for the uh, transmit of hyaloid vessels, the hyaloid artery and hyaloid vein. And we know that uh, in course of time, the hyaloid vessels will just degenerate and the proximal portion will be actually forming the central retinal vessels. So hyaloid vessels will be first supplying the developing lens. And you know that after birth, the lens is a, a, is a vascular structure. So what happens? The distal pa part of the hyaloid vessels will just degenerate and the proximal portion will be forming the central retinal vessels. So uh, something about the formation of lens in detail. We know that this is the optic placard or lens placard. It will get invaginated and it will form a lens vesicle and it will get separated from the ectoderm. Now the lens vesicle is actually lined by somewhat cuboidal cells. So it has got an anterior wall as well as a posterior wall. Now what happens is the posterior wall will elongate, the cells of the posterior wall will elongate and they will actually lose their nuclei to form the primary lens fibers. So the posterior wall cells lose their nuclei to form the primary lens fibers and they will actually reach the anterior wall and this space, this cleft between the anterior and posterior wall will get obliterated. Further addition of the lens fibers, the further addition you call it as secondary lens fibers. They are actually added uh, from the cells at the equatorial region. Now, uh, the, at this point, you know that uh, we have the hyaloid vessels which are supplying the lens and they, uh, they will be actually forming, uh, due to the blood supply, they will be, there will be a vascular membrane covering the lens. But soon after the degeneration of the hyaloid vessels, this vascular membrane will just disappear. 
and ultimately the lens will become a vascular. So why I mentioned about this vascular membrane is, uh, there is a pupillary membrane which is lying anterior to the uh, lens vesicle and that is actually covering the lens for a period of time and later say after seven months it will just disappear so that uh, we get a definite pupil. Now something about the formation of retina we know that this is the optic cup uh, by the formation of lens vesicle this is actually becoming bilayered. You call the two layers as the outer layer as well as the inner layer. The outer layer is actually giving rise to the formation of retinal pigmented epithelium and the inner layer you can see a pink color here and a yellow color here. So the inner layer is actually forming two parts anterior smaller portion and a posterior larger portion. So the posterior uh, larger portion is actually forming the uh, sensory layer of retina or the retina proper and the anterior smaller portion will be giving rise to ciliary body and iris. Now something about uh, the formation of vitreous body. So vitreous body is actually developed in two stages. First we will have the primary vitreous body developed then we have the definitive vitreous body. So these two bodies are uh, having two different sources. Primary vitreous body is ectodermal origin. The cells between the lens vesicle and the optic cup which are ectodermal they will be actually prolonging to form the primary vitreous body. Later what happens is the mesoderm which is lying, lining the optic cup that will be actually uh, growing into the uh, primary vitreous body to form the definitive vitreous body and the process from the vitreous body the definitive vitreous body will give rise to three important structures one is the suspensory ligament of lens then you have the hyaloid membrane and the hyaloid canal all these are actually derived from the definitive vitreous body so when you're asked about the formation of vitreous body we have the primary as well as the definitive one primary is ectodermal in origin whereas definitive is mesodermal in origin you have to keep that in mind. So uh, I mentioned about the formation of lens, uh, uh, mentioned about the blood supply of the lens and the formation of a vascular membrane covering the lens. So anteriorly, sometimes that vascular membrane won't go off and this is the clinical condition. So can, you ha can we have the poll? Identify the clinical condition that vascular membrane is not actually disappearing completely. So what do you call this clinical condition? Very good. That is known as persistent pupillary membrane. So in the beginning, we have the pupillary membrane, but uh, later on, what happens is the pupillary membrane will just uh, get degenerated once the anterior choroidal vessels, which are supplying the anterior aspect, uh, gets degenerated. But if it is persisting, it will be seen as a membrane in front of the lens. And that is known as persistent pupillary membrane. Now, let's move on. So that's the end of uh, today's session, the systemic embryology under the cent topic central nervous system and development of eye. Uh, so uh, can we have some questions from this session, Priyanka? Thank you, Dr. Rose. Uh, thank you for helping all the participants revise these crucial topics in embryology. Uh, we have received a lot of questions from the participants here. Uh, so we have picked up some questions that you can answer right now. Okay. Uh, the first question, Dr. Rose, is uh, can you please tell what all to write when asked about neural tube defects? Okay, uh, so neural tube defect is a very favorite question for most of the examiners and this occurs uh, due to a defect in the neurulation process, say roughly during three to four weeks. And it can be, uh, this defect can be either open to the surface or it can be closed with the skin. Now, open neural tube defects are more severe and uh, we have already seen a condition known as craniorachiasis, where the entire length of the neural tube is actually opening to the surface. 
and uh, we can also say about the different types of neural tube defect when the, when the anterior neuropore is not closing properly uh, we call it as an encephaly and the associated anomalies and if the Caudal neuropore is not uh, closing properly. We can say that condition as spina bifida and its different grades. Then neural tube defects are multifactorial. That means it can occur due to genetic or environmental factors. And the role of retinoic acid, insulin, and uh, high plasma glucose in the formation of neural tube defects have already been proved. And the folic acid supplementation can actually reduce the incidence by 75%. So all these points you can include when you're asked about the neural tube defects. Thank you, Dr. Rose. So, uh, one more question we want to take up now. Uh, this question is, has plane of retinal detachment got any embryological explanation? Actually, we, uh, we have already seen that the retina is made up of two layers, embryonically speaking, isn't it? The outer uh, pigmented layer and the inner neuronal layer or uh, the sensory retina. So, there is a potential space between the pigmented layer and the neural layer and that is known as intraretinal space. So uh, in the adult, the sensory retina is so closely linked with the retinal pigmented epithelium that uh, the production of visual pigment relies on this juxtaposition. So in the, in the human body, wherever there is a potential space, if there are uh, favorable conditions, what happens is the fluid will get automatically accumulated in that potential space. So there will be fluid collection in this intraretinal space and the two layers, the outer pigmented layer will get separated from the sensory layer and what happens is the retina can no longer function and the sight is lost in the detached portion. So retinal detachment, I think it is actually a misnomer because retina is not getting detached from anywhere. It is just the splitting up of the two layers of retina uh, in the space which was there embryologically, that is the intra in the, in the intra retinal space between these two layers, if you get a fluid collected, the pigmented layer can no longer lie closer to the sensory epithelium. So the retinal detachment, the retina is not actually getting detached from anywhere. It is just the filling of the intra retinal uh, space uh, which you have uh, during the embryonic period. Thank you, Dr. Rose. So uh, we will end the Q&A session here, but just to reiterate because we have a lot of other questions that are still remaining. So we will uh, send the answers to all those questions along with the questions of the previous two sessions uh, later to the participants on email. And also a recorded version will be uh, shared with the participants for all the three sessions. Uh, Dr. Rose, any closing remarks from your end? So I'm happy, so happy to uh, see many of you attending these three sessions. Uh, so this was just meant to be a revision session. Uh, I know uh, it's not a detailed session. So many of you might have found it difficult and many of you might have found it easy. So it is just a quick wrap of all the topics which we usually come across for the exams. Uh, so uh, if you want a detailed session of all these topics, you can very well uh, go to my YouTube channel. Uh, and all the best for my for the exams. And thank you, Elsevier team, for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Hello, ma'am. This is Dr. Kritika Rose. here. Uh, there is a, there are a lot of students who are asking. There are certain questions if you can recommend or suggest, which usually comes in the university. I guess students are really worried about the exams coming up. So we can just mention two or three questions related to this particular topic, which they should be focusing on, or something which comes in the universities, which can help them. Actually, from the central development of central nervous system, the neurulation is a favorite topic. Uh, neural tube defects, neurulation. Uh, then in the previous sessions, we have already shared many questions. Uh, then anencephaly, spina bifida. You can just uh, go through the grades, different grades of spina bifida. Uh, then development of eye, development of lens. Uh, development of lens is again separately asked. Then development of retina. All these are favorite questions as far as this session is concerned. The previous sessions, I think I have shared most of the questions which can be asked. Great. And of Thank course, you, the brain vesicles. We have already dealt in detail about the three brain vesicles, prosencephalon, mesencephalon, romencephalon, and their derivatives. That's it. Um, thank you, Dr. Rose. Uh, and I would like to thank everyone who attended the masterclass session today. Request you all to post your feedback about this session uh, in the Q&A section and uh, we'll be able to follow up then. Please keep connected to the Facebook page of Elzevir India for further updates. Thank you.
Thank you.